Come on, Google, you can do it. It worked. <laughs> I wonder, you wonder how many magic unicorns or le leprechauns are inside Google's data centers when you click the start button. They all went on strike last week. <laughs> uh, cool. Welcome to this week's Repair Radio. We are super excited to uh, be covering. There's so much tech news that's been going on, and we have our special guest from Jerry Rig Everything. Zach is here. Yes, I am. Hey, Zach, excited to have you. And also all the way in from Buffalo, we've got Kevin Purdy. Hello. Hey, Kevin. So uh, all kinds of stuff has been happening. But but before we dive into that, uh, it seems to me that that Zach has a uh, has it in for Tesla. Or at least I have seen you like firing weapons at Tesla vehicles. What's that all about? I have. So there's a company local to me here in Utah that actually makes bulletproof vehicles. You know, they totally dis disassemble like the metal panels, take out the regular glass and put in bulletproof like stuff all inside of the car, which looks really, really cool. And then uh, I got lucky enough that they wanted me to come out and shoot it a couple of times. That's pretty badass. Yeah, and it's pretty sweet. It's a, it's not you don't have any animosity against Tesla. This no, is just no. I love Tesla. Tesla's awesome. <laughs> Who uh, who is the market for bulletproof Teslas? Um, they said they ship a lot overseas, you know, Saudi Arabia and stuff like that. You know, where you know things are a little uh, more tense, I should say. Oh, and then just real. you know, rich people in general, because like you can buy a Tesla for like you know sixty grand and then spend another forty grand on top of that to bulletproof it. But when you're pulling in you know millions and millions of dollars a year, it's not that much money right. to just bulletproofing to your car. Sure. And you, you think Mission Impossible movies are so far fetched, and then you hear about bulletproof Teslas going overseas. It's impressive. I would think Mexico. The problem with Mexico, there's money in Saudi Arabia. There's not. A, there's not as much money in Mexico. Yeah, uh, interesting. I mean, well, all the drug lords are probably, but there aren't that many of them. Valid. I don't know if their drug lords are like environmentally conscious enough to. <laughs> I guess that's true. But the Saudis are. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> Dude, but they, they i mean they're doing uh they're doing bulletproofing for all kinds of other cars too right yeah yeah they do everything they had like huge suvs they're bulletproofing yeah. like like they don't do sports cars as much it's mostly you want a car that has enough room in the side panels and that can handle the weight because it adds like you know five six hundred pounds to the vehicle when you put all the extra stuff inside yeah. Um, you, uh, your video is really great at explaining the way that bulletproofing works. Uh, and so everyone go check out that video. It, it, you talk about how it's, it's not really the thing is preventing any kind of ingress of a bullet from any angle into the passenger or driver cabin, you know? Exactly. So are, the thing I was wondering is like, are they making new panels to replace the standard panels? Or are they laying another like kind of clip on, you know, melt on thing onto the existing Tesla panels? So what they do, the Tesla, like the aluminum panels that sit on the outside of the car, there's space inside of that between that metal panel and the inside. Mm -hmm. And basically they're putting these uh, thin, probably, you know, about that thick paneling between those two uh, surfaces. That way the bullet goes through the aluminum, obviously, but then stops when it hits the bulletproof stuff on the inside. So they're okay. not like rebuilding the outside of the car from scratch. They're just sticking insulation of sorts yeah. in between the panels. And they're, the, the windows are not operable anymore? I Depends on what you do. Because if, if you get a bulletproof glass to like you know withstand handgun bullets, then it's thin enough that it can go up and down still. Okay. But if you're withstanding um, you know, rifle rounds, which are a lot you know, more powerful, then the glass is so thick that it doesn't go up and down anymore inside of the door. It's, it's amazing to me there's still room for the, the handgun uh, glass and then the armor inside the door and it can still go up and down. Right, right. It's pretty uh, cool maybe. stuff. It's really cool. Because I think there's probably also the aerodynamics of the of the vehicle. Probably the 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 doors need to be a little bit wider than. Do they give you any yeah. indication? Oh, sorry. Um, did they give you any indication whether it's easier or harder to bulletproof a Tesla versus a Chevy Malibu? <laughs> you know, like any any standard kind of gas guzzling car. Um, not really. They I don't, I don't remember them saying anything about it. I mean, I am. I personally, it's my own assumption that it's easier to do a bigger car like that just because mm -hmm. there's more room to work with. But that's just me talking. I don't, I didn't really ask the guys. Gotcha. 
it's been interesting watching the rich, rich rebuilds channel over the years as he's gotten more comfortable with Tesla's and he's now, right. yeah, they built the Lego car. They're really easy to work on. Yeah. He's got some cool stuff going on. He's, he's got, uh, he's got, he's got, uh, started his own repair shop now. So I know if I, if I needed someone, if I had a Tesla and I needed someone to work on it, I would totally drive it across the country to take it to rich. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we're, we're hoping to have Rich on, on the show one of these days. So another one of the awesome guides, uh, videos that you put out was, um, you have a, you have a, you're lucky to have friends who are okay with you taking apart their Teslas. Um, you also attached a hitch to a model three and, uh, there is no way you can buy a Tesla with a trailer hitch option on it. It's not something they really, uh, market segmented out, but, um, so can you give us a little background, like, you know, why you wanted to put a trailer hitch on a Model 3 and also like what, what the process was like? Yeah. So the Model 3s, especially, you know, like the performance edition, they're super, super powerful. Like there's just so much torque. Uh, they can, even though they're not rated for towing stuff, they can tow pretty well. Um, so there's after there's third party, like aftermarket companies that make these, you know, hitches for the Model 3. But in order to install them, you have to do it yourself because it's not factory. Um, so Ben from the YouTube uh, channel called Tesla Nomics. He was like, "Dude, come out, let's do this to my Tesla because it can it can tow like a fair amount with all the power mm -hmm. that it has." So we uh, we pulled off the bumper. Um, it took us probably I'm trying to remember like three or four hours um, to the whole thing all said and done because we did have to cut a little bit of the of the bumper out to make room for the the hitch. Um, but it was pretty sleek. The actual hitch part can detach and like you wouldn't even know that it's installed on the car. I had um, never seen a, a hitch like that where you, you cut a hole in the bottom of the bumper and then and then all the mechanism is hidden and then you just, you know, socket it in underneath the bumper when you want your hitch on. Yeah, but it's super smart because sure. like, it doesn't lower your it doesn't hit on things like when you're just driving around normally, you know. So right. is this just a can we can we possibly do this? Let's see. Let's challenge ourselves thing. Or was there a, an actual uh, hauling need uh, for the, for the, was it really like a real uh, use case where they wanted to have uh, a hitch on there? So he didn't necessarily want to like tow trailers and stuff. He just wanted the option to put bikes on the back. Um, Cause I think Tesla sells an option where you can like mount it to the roof, but he mm. didn't want like a roof rack. He just wanted this super hidden hitch that he can use yeah. when he wants and then not use when he doesn't want it. That makes sense. And there's yeah. these, I mean, fantastic bike, uh, you know, hitch attachments. I would think, I mean, you could tow a little aluminum boat with it, uh, you know, a little fishing He's, boat. I think we decided that as long as it was under like 2,000 pounds, then we'd be all right towing with yeah. that hit. Yeah. Do you have a Tesla yourself? Um, kind of yes and kind of no. Um, huh. <laughs> Most car titles are pretty black and white. Right. Well, uh, so my parents have one. Let's just say that. Ah. And, uh, I get to drive that one around. Okay. <laughs> um, have you had to do any maintenance work on it or anything like that? Uh, no, I haven't, which is kind of the nice thing about Tesla's. Well, here's the thing. So there was actually, they, it was parked in my mom's garage and there was this metal rack on the raw, on the wall and the metal rack fell off and hit the side of the Tesla Oof. and like gouged the metal paneling all the way down the side. So that was like five grand to fix, but that's not necessarily, um, you know, it's not, it would, it would have been five grand with any car mm -hmm. Tesla or not to fix that. That's were, were they able to get parts reasonably quickly? Um, it was all just third party. They just like added material. It wasn't, uh, oh, okay. So they were just able to do it in your normal body shop. Is that everybody says that's the challenge with getting Tesla's fixed is the shops may be able to do the work, but the parts supply chain is so backed up. I've heard of shops, right. uh, cars sitting in the shop for months waiting right. for body panels. MKBHD had his car side swiped. It was in the shop forever. Yeah. Uh, so Tesla just put out these DIY maintenance guys. Did you see these things? Yeah. Um, so I'm not going to comment on the quality of their technical communication. <laughs> that's, very, that's very good of you, Kyle. <laughs> which is which is sad because we've actually we we helped. Um, uh, I mean, this is it's been a few years back, but Tesla came to us and wanted people to help them write some of their internal documentation. We helped them hire six engineering students that we had trained. Uh, oh, really? They knew how to write service manuals well. Um, but I think they went off into their manufacturing line. They were working on the instructions for how to build the cars. And clearly they were not involved in, in creating <laughs> these DIY instructions. Yeah, interesting. I watched, the, I watched the air cabin one and it's, it's trippy. 
like the way they show the air filter, the air cabin filter, the way they sh the, like show a white glowing filter, like sinking into a gray cabin. And then just like, it, it's, it's a, it's very uh, trippy, but at least like, you know, they, they show you how to do it eventually. Yeah. I think it's a good idea. I mean, I like how they they start with like the super easy repairs that, you know, everyone should know how to do, but it's also some of that stuff is common sense if you've done it before, I guess. Um, but it's still nice of Tesla to put it out. Yeah, they didn't they like parts navigator. They've got this uh, like SVG where you can you can look up the parts catalog. It's it's epc.teslamotors.com, and it looks like you have to log in. But there's a there's a public access link, and then you can browse through uh, and and you know, navigate through every single part in in all the the major cars and and identify the model number, which then you could hypothetically order from somebody. So are we allowed to like let's say let's say I need a new side panel can I order that just no. for myself or does it have to go through the dealer still You'd have to go through the dealer and that's the interesting thing is they've got this parts catalog up uh but you can't actually do anything with it unless you know yeah. you get rich or somebody to grab you a part off of a salvaged uh car um, so, but the information is there and it's a it's a pretty slick SVG native like really high resolution uh vector image viewer for navigating through and finding all the parts so why do you think they would release that without letting us actually buy it? Because the right to repair legislation that Massachusetts passed requires they make this information available. It doesn't require that they sell parts to consumers. So they're complying with the leather of the law. Hmm. They wouldn't Weird. They wouldn't be doing this if they weren't. I mean, and it, it's clear, if you, it's funny because you look in there and there's got quantity and there's like an order or where the order link would be and it says contact Tesla. And it's clear that it's the same system that they have available for their authorized dealers to order parts. You just have to have a login in order to order parts. Yeah. So, so in order, but not only is there the cost of the Tesla itself, but you also have to put in the time to become friends with a Tesla dealer. That's such a, such a long burden. Yes. Uh, and it's interesting because I mean, the, the, with, as the Model Three volumes ramp up, I think the repair pain for Tesla is going to be significant. I, you might not know this for for the traditional auto uh, auto manufacturers, they only do about twenty five percent of the maintenance on these vehicles themselves. The other seventy five percent is all your local garages. And and Tesla's saying, well, no, we, we can handle one hundred percent of that. And as they're cranking out five hundred thousand cars a year, I don't know if they'll be able to scale up their service to match no. that. I don't think so, nor would like they want to, you know, I feel like they should just focus on making new cars and leave the repairs to everybody else. I mean, the good thing about Tesla's is that, you know, the maintenance down the road with less moving parts isn't going to be as bad, but it's still like, you know, body damage and stuff like that. They should, right. we should be able to get replacement panels. Yeah. And there are, I mean, you got things like the, the handles on the Model S that I think fail a lot. They fail pretty routinely after after three years or something. You're out of your warranty, uh, but it is a mechanical moving part because they decided to be aerodynamic and slick, and then your yeah. handle doesn't pop out. Yeah. Which would be a pretty frustrating problem. I think it's pretty hard to use the car if you can't open the handle, open right. the door. Can you open the door with like an app or something? I don't own a Tesla and I've never used one, so I, I don't know. Like if your door handle fails, are you completely locked out of your car? I'm not sure. My my parents have a three. They have got the three, so yeah. All right. Please, please let us know in the comments section if you have a Tesla. <laughs> Can you open the car? Uh, interesting. I mean, uh, you know, unless you got bulletproof glass, you've always got a way into the car. It's just you know, it's an expensive way in. Right. What What did you think? I mean, and I realize you're just working on the bumper, which is relatively similar. But is your perception that that working on a Tesla is is similar to other cars you've worked on? Yeah. So, I mean, I have, I drive a Toyota Tacoma, um, which short little rant here. So I used to have uh, a 98 Toyota Tacoma. So like 20 years old, give or take. And uh, if I needed to replace the windshield on that thing, it was like 200 bucks, right? Just like a huge slab of glass, not a big deal. Today, I went to go replace the windshield in my 2018 Toyota Tacoma, $800. What? <laughs> $100. And it was like 300 for the glass, which is like three or 400 for the glass, which is reasonable. I mean, it's like, it's new. I understand that. But then it was like another three or 400 bucks to calibrate the camera sitting behind the glass that does like the lane change huh. warning stuff. Yeah. It's like, I don't know, just getting a new vehicle is just a pain. 
all yeah. these new features just on my car on my car when you know i live in buffalo so uh side mirrors are always in danger from snow plows and you know trash cans and stuff like that and so the the mirror the, the glass and the mirror is like you know 30 bucks uh the the chat the shell of it is like 50 bucks but then the electronics that let you control the mirror from inside the cabin and that we defrost the glass on it and stuff like that that it adds to a 560 dollar side mirror right but also, so my fiance, I'm engaged, which is pretty, I'm pretty happy about Congratulations. that. Um, Congratulations. <laughs> very excited. Yeah. Um, but she broke her side mirror on her um, Subaru and it's not heated, but it is motorized. And so the whole thing was like 200 bucks, but I managed to find the mirror itself for 20 bucks. So left the motor in and just replaced the front glass for $20, which. Oh, nice. Yeah. So, I <laughs> I, I couldn't get uh, OEM glass for uh, my brother had an Acura. And so we just went down to the glass place. We just traced it out and then we had them cut us a, just a regular mirror. And it turns out there, there there's actually magical properties to, uh, to you know, the, where they reflect uh, mirror, you know, lights, headlights less. And so I don't recommend doing that. You want to get actual <laughs> auto glass. I thought you found a loophole, but I guess not. It was it was blindingly bright, and I think uh, we ended up having to. <laughs> we thought, oh, it's just a mirror. No, it's not just a mirror. It's it's a little bit special. Did you find that out yourself on like a long drive to a ball game or something? <laughs> and, oh no, <laughs> oh, we we have managed to. Yeah, yeah. You don't actually want to reflect 100 percent of the light that comes in into your eyes. That's that's not a good strategy. Uh, which is why we need we need right to repair. We need these folks selling these things to us. So Zach, tell tell us about your engagement. Did you did you do, uh, propose in any interesting or unique way? Uh, no, I, I decided to keep it a little bit more low key, just because like you know, I've been pretty public with her in the past with the off road wheelchair and stuff. Um, but then, so just our engagement, we went back to the second place, um, or we went back to the location of our second date. Okay. Um, we spent like just six hours just talking to each other and uh, just proposed right there, super chill, yeah, yeah. just us. And then a buddy off to the side taking pictures that she didn't know about. <laughs> there was no threat of her saying no. Uh, yeah, yeah, we were fine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I proposed in a kind of backwoods area and uh, I was super nervous going in and I was, I was kind of rushing and there were uh, uh, half a dozen streams that I had to navigate through in my Explorer and I got, I got excited and I ran through one of the streams too fast and I flooded the engine. And so oh, then we're there, and I'm, I'm, you know, sweating bullets. I'm nervous. I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready to propose, and we're, we're stuck in the river. <laughs> uh, and I was, I, I kind of kept my cool, and I was, all right, we're just gonna wait, uh, two minutes. And the heat from the engine was able. I didn't. We weren't so low that we were, you know, getting, getting more water coming into the engine. That was just what I had splashed up. And so the ev engine eventually dried off, and then I was able to start and go. And then I was, I was more sedate. I was not driving I through the. I feel like there's a really broad metaphor for marriage that you can disentangle from that somehow, but it requires <laughs> being stuck in a river, having to wait for things to cool, cool off. I, I'll let someone else do that work though. Yeah. Maybe it starts off bad and gets worse. I don't really know. <laughs> patience. Or, patience yeah, is the key. Okay, patience, that's a better yeah. one. That's a better the more one. you try yeah. to fix it, the worse you can make it. Um, <laughs> in a completely natural segue, um, the, the <laughs> one plus seven pro, which I have here. So this is, yes. I've got the internals of that one plus, so I'm, I'm looking at it, but you know, speaking of patience, Zach, you beat us to this teardown. So we're, we're very angry with you. I thought <laughs> you guys beat me. No, I did the clear version. Then you guys did the teardown. Okay. Then I did my teardown after okay. that. So it was a, it was a mixed combo. <laughs> All right. But you had the phone before we did, which is, which is fair. I mean, this it's, is it's true. Okay. So, it's so it's give us your impressions of this device. This is, you know, one plus is, is making, I mean, right. This is the budget flagship phone. Yes. And so like for the price, I think it's super awesome. Um, but at the same time, I feel like there's a lot more sub $500 phones coming out with excellent specs. Have you heard of the uh, Red Magic 3? The yeah. Nubia Red Magic 3? So I got my hands on that and it's like the specs on that are crazy um, for less than 500 bucks, which isn't something like you would expect in this day and age. We're looking at mm -hmm. like normally 800 to thousand dollars for you know, a flagship smartphone, but like, you know, and I don't know anything about the longevity or the software of the, right. of the red magic three, but it seems pretty solid. Yeah. And that's how uh, vanilla is the Android that they're, that one plus is, I mean, they've got so, their own custom camera app. I don't do anything software related at all. I mean, the phone I use is like two years old. I, I barely yeah. even get into the phones software wise. Yeah. We never turn them on either. 
Right. <laughs> but that, I mean, it's a, the longevity of software updates is important. Like my, the Motorola that I have is part of the Android One program, and so they continue to make software updates. And I'm on the latest uh, Pi, you know, Android Nine, and it's great. Yeah. Um, uh, so getting those those updates and running vanilla Android is an important part of the experience. Yeah, I agree. Those are important. All right. Well, know. let's talk about the hardware then. That's that's what that's what we're both more into. So, uh, what do you, what did you think of the build quality? I mean, the inside of this it's completely uh, it's a it's a unibody chassis that's that's uh, machined out. So this is not a not an inexpensive chassis. Yeah. Um, my favorite part, obviously, is the moving parts in this with the motorized camera. Yeah. Um, so when 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 OnePlus comes out and makes a claim that the camera can go up and down three hundred thousand times, what do you think about that? Do you think it's in like controlled situations? That's what I think. I think like butterfly keyboard. Yeah, like it totally works in the labs or like like the Galaxy, Galaxy Fold. Fold. But oh yeah, they they opened and closed it. You know, with their perfectly folding robot. Uh, yeah. But the real world will put torque on it, or you'll accidentally open it while it's in your pocket with your keys or. So what do you think? Do you think it's going to last that? Do you think it's going to last the normal two or three year lifespan of a phone or do you think it's going to give out? I think the camera will give out sooner. Would be my prediction. I think, I think you're going to get dust in it or sand or, I mean, I, I can't. So I, <laughs> every weekend I'm, I'm doing work in the yard. I'm, I'm, you know, uh, cutting things with chainsaw and every uh, Sunday night, this is a ritual. Now I got to get a toothpick or a needle and clean sawdust out of my uh, USB charge port. Wow. And, so I'm just imagining me with this phone. I would be guaranteed to have uh, <laughs> guaranteed to have sawdust in the camera. Yeah, OnePlus did put like a little bit of effort into keeping dust out. They have like this little tiny rubber ring around the inside of the camera when it slides up and down that hole. Um, but yeah, I imagine with enough dirt and sand, it would get clogged up in there at some point. Were you able to get the display off without breaking it? Uh, no, shattered that thing. Yeah, we did too. <laughs> Yeah, so that's, I mean, I, I guess zoom to the end, our conclusion, we gave it a four out of 10, partially because of the way that you open it. And I mean, getting getting to the display, the display feels like it's the part that, I mean, it's the part that always breaks and, and we weren't able to, to get at it without breaking it. Yeah, and maybe you know the answer to this or maybe it's uh, super specific, but with the, I don't know, you guys, do you take off the display entirely after you broke it? Um, I, I This one is, is, is still completely on. Did you guys ever remove the display on this? No, we didn't. We never fully removed it. We were just trying to get it. I mean, so th that would be the next step yeah. is to separate the, the display from the, the chassis. So when I when I shattered my screen off, um, the glass was totally separate from the uh, the AMOLED panel because it's like that 90 hertz, you know, AMOLED display. But it was like a paper, like super flexible display instead of like a rigid because usually the AMOLEDs are like crackable like glass. Right. You know what I mean? Um, so I was just wondering if you had any more details. No, I mean, maybe we should, we should take this apart more and, and see, I mean, that would make sense for them getting that. That's how they would do the curved edge. Curved, Yeah. So yeah. going all the way to the edge, you're gonna, and that's, I mean, that all AMOLEDs are that, are that flexible. And then they, they, you know, glue additional layers onto it to give it additional structural support and rigidity. And, um, that's why we've always said the, the Samsung edge phones are so much more expensive to repair than the regular galaxy. Right. My two-year-old Galaxy S8, I looked into fixing the screen yesterday because it's got this burn-in problem going on right now. Um, and it was still like 190 bucks even yeah. after two years. And that's that's cheap. Uh, the, the, the Samsung keeps a really tight control over the parts supply. <laughs> uh, and, I mean, we can get the parts, but they're crazy expensive. Right. And Samsung is intentionally keeping the repair prices high. Like, they want to push you out of a repair and into a new unit. And you can read a lot about it on a blog post on ifixit.org. Soon to be, no, yeah. We, on iFixit, you can see a whole post where I dig in way too deep and try to figure out why AMOLEDs cost so much to maintain and replace. Interesting. With In the in two minutes, why are they so expensive? Um, the burn-in that you're currently experiencing on your phone, it makes it really hard for there to be aftermarket parts because any phone that's X years old is going to probably experience some burn-in. Uh, with AMOLEDs. Um, so we can't harvest parts really because right. Right. they are super fragile as you guys have learned by taking apart phones and trying to not break the display and inevitably breaking the display. Uh, they're, you know, so they're fragile. They're hard to harvest and repair out of uh, phones. Samsung controls 95% of the mobile OLED market. And so why would they make <laughs> G 
cheap aftermarket uh, displays for anybody if they didn't have to. Um, yeah, and it's also just a, it's a lot more complicated than the LCDs that we all had uh, five years ago. Um, pe you know, there was a whole industry for recouping those from phones. So yeah, uh, it's not your fault is what I'm saying, Zach. You're, yeah. you're, it's not your fault. Well, and it's to the point where if you go into your local repair shops, uh, they're fixing iPhones and they can fix the Samsungs, but they generally don't. And you ask them like, hey, you know, how much of your business is Samsung? And it's almost no shops. I mean, they'll, they'll say it's under 5%. Uh, but they get all customers coming in all the time and then they quote the repair price, what the part costs them, and then everybody declines the repair. So the, the artificially propped up price of the service parts is, is single-handedly stifling the repair market. Hmm. Yeah. And people who are on cell phone contracts, you say like, hey, would you like to sp spend $300 to get a, you know, the same phone you had before? Or, you know, you, there's probably some incentive to upgrade, which is uh, also uh, Samsung's bulwark they're excited about. So you gotta you gotta work with OnePlus a little bit on the teardown. Were you able to get any additional information out of them? Uh, I mean, it's kind of nice to have more of a conversation with a with a manufacturer than just our usual. I bought your device and posted the video on the internet. So I've worked with two manufacturers to make teardown videos. Uh, one back with LG and like the LG G6 or something. They sponsored a teardown, and so when I rolled up, uh, they flew me out to New York to make this teardown video with the LG G6. I get to this room, it's me, the phone, and like four of their sales representatives, like their marketing team. And I was like, all right, any tips you got? And they're like, we've never seen the inside. We're waiting for you. To do it. <laughs> <laughs> so you like, tell us. No tips from LG there. And then I went to um, OnePlus to take apart their phone. It's the same thing. Like no technical like tips or tricks or anything. It's just like, here's a table. Glad you brought your own tools. Have at it. Which is strange because like OnePlus's market image, you know, for their whole existence has been like, you know, the different kind of cell phone maker, like we'll try anything essentially, you know, we're, um, we're making phone uh, mid range or, or flagship phones for less, you know, like, I always feel like they've had a geeky appeal. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure if I pushed hard enough, they would, they would find, uh, you know, a technical guy to bring out and like help me out. But like, it's just, it's never really been an option. I just like have fun. You live on a different side of the company for them. Yeah, I'm yeah. Mostly promotional and stuff is what they're after, but yeah. Everyone in the chat is super worried that we're not live and we are totally live guys and here's a shoe to prove it. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> That's Kelsey's shoe. Yeah, we'll 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 throw the what was we got we got repair dog in the background over here. So, I threw the shoe near Pebbles. Pebbles no. didn't react at all. This is a very sedate dog. Not live as opposed to, I like. I mean, we're doing we're doing this live, guys. Come on. Oh, this is no rehearsal, no no limits. All right. That's <laughs> wait. Why a shoe? Like, is that some kind of meme that I missed that out? Someone on? someone said you, you got to prove that, that it's live. And we said, well, how do you want to prove it? And I said, okay, well, we'll you know. I don't. I mean, it's it's hangouts on air. We can't fake hang. How would you even do that? I guess we could we could pre-record and then and then put it on the HDMI playback and then I, I, it would be so much harder to fake doing it live than to actually just do it live. Right. I uh, um, <laughs> one plus seven. You did a video where you also showed um, how to get the uh, the clear back panel, um, and then you've also done this for the phone I have, the Pixel Two. And like every time I look at that thing, I'm like, yeah, it's time for a clear back. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's so is it something you just kind of discovered that like all these phones are using a very thin film of paint on their glass panels and that they're almost can most of them just be made clear with a little scratching? Yeah, so I started doing it back with the LG. No, not the Galaxy S6, I think. So it's been a couple of years. Um, and I saw a picture on Reddit of someone who had done it. So my first video, I linked to that Reddit page and like show like, hey, this is where I got the idea. Um, and then I started to do it to every single glass phone after that. And some of the glass layers are different. Like some are their film that can peel off and some are like a paint um, that need like paint stripper or something sprayed on first before it'll, you know, come off. Mm -hmm. um, but every glass phone is kind of, you know, the same basic process. It makes you wonder why manufacturers aren't offering a clear glass option from the jump. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it might be some kind of like UV thing. Like they don't want the, you know, UV light to come inside of the phone, but like, you can get clear UV films um, to put on the underside of glass too. 
It oh, yeah. The same. Our, I, our tear down wallpapers where we post the insides uh, so you can put it in your desktop. Those are very popular. And we actually we are coming out with a, a new line of uh, of cases for these things that have either an X-ray or a photo of the internals. So if you don't want to put in the time that Zach has to clear it, you can you know, sort of simulate the experience, but not not as cool as it's um, probably safer that way in the long term to keep the water resistance and stuff. Yeah. Oh. So you're, you're kind of, yeah, all your videos encourage me to scratch the, the paint off this thing, but you personally are telling me, hmm, be wary. Say, if you don't need to open up the phone to fix something else, then yeah, leave it sealed shut. Okay. But once you're inside. Once yeah, you're already not? inside, then you might as well. Okay. Yeah. This, this is good. This is good inside info. Right. Uh, so let, let's talk about, um, let's talk about your ex experience kind of getting into this thing. What, I mean, once, once you had the back off, what do you think of their mechanical design and construction here? The mechanical design. I mean, honestly with, so I've been doing these, I've been making videos for like seven years or so. And it's like when you've, all the phones are kind of the same after a while. Mm -hmm. Like if you've taken apart one phone, there's a good chance that you can take apart another phone and be successful at it. Um, yeah. So I don't feel like, uh, one plus has done a whole lot different than other manufacturers. It's still the metal and glass sandwich. Um, I do like that. They made the battery easy to pull out. Super simple. You don't have to worry about puncturing the battery or anything. Yeah. They um, got the handy pull tab on it, which is fan Why does no one else do that? From, from now on in every single one of my teardowns, if the battery's glued in, I'm going to say, don't buy this phone, buy something else. Cause like manufacturers should legitimately stop doing that. Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's driving driving us crazy, uh, and it's a huge problem for recycling too. It's it's right. uh, I mean, it's just across the board, uh, there are there are simple, straightforward things you can do, and the batteries are consumable. It's not like, <laughs> yeah, no matter what, like in in a year or two years, like my phone, I've had it for a little over two years, and I charge it up. It's plugged in right now while I'm talking to you guys, um, because around one o'clock, I'm down to like thirty percent. And I have to charge it up to get to the end of the day after that. Because just the batteries, you know, I use it a lot and it's, it drains quick yeah. now. It's been two years. What phone are you using? The Galaxy S8 Plus. Okay, very good. And you've managed to not break the screen? I mean, you got OLED burn in, but but you haven't. It's still one piece. I always have a case on it. So it's like, yeah. it's never not in a case. <laughs> Despite how you, you, you seem to somehow, all your videos end with your phones destroyed. So I assume maybe that would carry <laughs> over to your personal phone. No, I treat this one a little nicer than the rest of them. So uh, kind of a meta question for you. We're both taking apart these things. And then at the end, we give ours a repairability score. You're not necessarily, you know, you're reviewing them for durability and other things, uh, not not just serviceability. But have you ever uh, looked at our, our score and said, nah, these guys got that wrong? No, I feel like you guys, you guys have a very systematic approach to it. And I've never been, there was one phone that you said was like 100% not repairable. And I was like, well, it's not that bad but like i see where you're coming from but like for the most part 99 percent of the time i agree 100 percent with you guys that's that, that, that's reaffirming me to hear i always know i'm always afraid that you know someone someone's gonna <laughs> we'll give something that well we gave this phone a four and so if you found some easy way in you're like no guys this ought to be an eight i would feel no. yeah no, it's increasingly yeah, it's the it's the, as they go thinner it's these these flimsy easily breakable components that are glued down and the process of, you know, heating it systematically and lifting it off carefully um, is seeming to me the increasing challenge with, with most Android phones out there. Yeah. And, you know, nowadays, basically every phone is hard to repair. So yeah, if you give it uh, less than a five, you're probably, you're probably right. So speaking of things that are that are hard to repair, one of the first kind of low scoring uh, devices we had was the uh, the iPod Touch back in the day. It's been it's been a long time since we've done an iPod Touch teardown. I think we gave the last one a four out of ten. But Apple just released a new iPod Touch. What? No, I, I feel like hell is frozen over or something. Right. Um, it's I like new one. Mac Mini day. <laughs> right, and I'm, no problem here. Usually the Apple videos get a lot of views, so that's why I like Apple. Yeah. So iPod Touch uh, can run us through the specs on this on this new one. Um, so honestly, the only thing I've noticed is that it's hard to find on their website, and that is it. I bought it, <laughs> and I know nothing else about it. If you go to Apple.com right now, they're looking kind of desperate. Like, they've got the prices. You're like, Apple.com, maybe I'm interested in many things from Apple. Nope, you need to buy an iPhone XR. They're $19.99 a month. Uh, the, the the price is in 72-point font. Um, I feel like after their earnings disappointment a few months ago, 
there was some kind of internal fire drill at Apple where they're like, everyone in the company must focus on selling more iPhones. Yeah, specifically the iPhone 10R, which is like their worst phone. Right. And it's 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 four hundred and seventy nine dollars if you, you trade know, in your phone or something. Yeah, you have to trade in your phone, and it's it's like trading in your car at the dealership. You're never gonna get as good a value yeah. trading it into the manufacturers if you sold it yourself. Right. Exactly. Who is the iPod Touch for today? Like, I, I understand that some people are pretty excited that they are putting it out, but like, I also could understand people are like, oh, why would you buy a fake phone? <laughs> like, why would you buy a phone? That isn't a phone. Personally, I think it's for the like the sub sixteen year old audience. Yeah, who doesn't, okay. you know, They don't need a phone phone. They just need something that connects to the internet. Ah, yeah, they need a Fortnite and um, you know, music machine. Yeah, because plus you can basically do everything a phone can if you're on Wi Fi right. with an iPod. Right. Type, so yeah, it doesn't have a it doesn't have an earpiece speaker and microphone, which I think is kind of a, a lost opportunity. If they had if they'd put it on there, then it's basically a, a it's a Wi Fi iPhone. Right. Yeah, I was gonna say, can you use like Duo? You can put you can plug a headset into it, and then and then use you know a microphone, and then you put Skype on it, and you're good to go. Oh, okay. Or FaceTime or whatever. FaceTime. Yeah. Hmm. Honestly, if they sold a two hundred dollar like iPod with an earpiece, no one will buy iPhones anymore because everyone's on Wi-Fi all the time anyway. You know, I think I think that's I think they're afraid of of undercutting iPhone sales, but it's just such a a fantastic product. You have a general purpose iOS device. I mean, the the beef with the the iPod Touch has been that it's got it's had such an old processor. It's had this five year old processor. So now they're updating. It's got an A8, uh, which is not cutting edge, but it's a it's a substantial spec bump. What was the A8 from? The A8 is three years old. We're on the A12 now. So. Okay. But I don't. Why couldn't they have put an A12 in it, or why couldn't they have had two versions? Like, like charge me a hundred bucks more and give me the current processor. But would you, with the iPod Touch, would you really need all that power? It's yeah, absolutely. I want to play Fortnite, or you know, I mean, you think about these kids like overwhelmingly, you're playing video games on it. Yeah, that's true. Uh, and and also, you think about age. I mean, if it's been five years since they've updated it, it's probably going to be another five years until we get another iPod Touch, if we ever do. So give us a current processor, and then it'll it'll last for four years. They're yeah. gonna they're gonna roll out iOS, you know, thirteen, fourteen. It's gonna slow down the performance on these things. And if you're on, I mean, what what is the, the iPhone SE? Does that have an A as well? I'm not sure. It's got an A10 on on the SE. Oh, the Touch has an A10. Okay, so that's better. Okay. I'm I I misspoke a ten, but still it's it's not the cutting edge. It's yeah. Um, well, well, so we are currently tinkering. So the SE has an A nine. Ah, so, so but that, that's something they need to spec on too, right? Because the SE is their kind of you know entry level phone, and and they the, all their operating systems have to run on on the SE. There's the there's an iPod Touch in the teardown shop. We're looking at it. We're poking. Yeah, around. we got one here now. Are you? Do you have one yet? Um, it said it got delivered, but I probably won't make my video until like next week or the week after. So you guys are gonna go ahead and go ahead and do your thing. We'll do our thing. I don't know. I, I don't know when we'll when we'll run it if we if we get it out this week or early next week. But yeah, we're we're excited to get one. The, the, my the best feature is the headphone jack. Right. <laughs> I'm just imagining these kids. You've got you've got six year old with the phone, and then you're like, yeah, and you got to have the AirPods, and you got to train kids on how to you know charge all these things and keep your your battery. Like, what are we teaching kids these days? Teaching them to juggle battery life. Yeah, I think it's headphone jacks are still important in my opinion. But yes, yeah, tell one plus that, please. Yeah, they won't <laughs> listen to me. <laughs> They're on their own. So, what do you think of the Pixel Three A? Um, I like it. I haven't been inside of it. Have you guys done the teardown? Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and they, we get, we upgraded the the score. What, Kevin, what did it get? Uh, six or seven? I, I, it didn't get a seven. I think it got a six. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah it got how, a six, which is a, which is a bump up because we give the Pixel Three a four, um, yeah. so we think it's dramatically more repairable than that. And I mean, it's it's like on par. We, we're also giving the iPhone a six, so it's like the only like current Android phone that is scoring that high. Many internal Slack threads about that score, but I, I think we've landed on the right one. Interesting. Um, yeah, so I like it. I think for you know, it, I think that I think the market's going to start heading back to the sub five hundred dollar phones. Like the thousand dollar phones are not sustainable for most people, and so I like I like where Google's headed with that. 
I, I think so too. I just, I, I've had so many people ask me, uh, you know, what's the difference if I'm paying twice as much for the phone, you know, what, wh what am I getting for, for that? And I, I just have such a hard time answering that question. It's like, well, better camera, better chipset. Well, yeah. But then up until now, you know, the better camera has been a big part of the answer, but like the, the promise of Google all this time has been, you know, their huge, 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 uh, server farm that they can point at problems and fix. And like, they kind of can do that with their cameras now where a large part of what makes their cameras so good is like the software riding alongside it. So, you know, things like night sight and stuff like that, uh, work really well on even this not totally top of the line pixel three, a phone. So I'm interested by that, that they've been able to use software to kind of make their mid range phone seem more like a flagship in some ways. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious. So this is, this is the one plus camera module and it's got, you know, three independent, uh, all optical image stabilization. And I think the, I, I don't know this for sure, but I would imagine it certainly seems that the budget phones don't have optical image stabilization where the higher end phones do. So that's gotta be a, a cost driver. Right. The phone I just took apart that I haven't posted video of yet was the red magic three. Um, and that one does not have optical image stabilization, but it can film in 8k, which is interesting. It's the yeah. first <laughs> mobile phone that can film in 8K. Is this, this is something that's perhaps a little more appealing to the, the Zacks of the world than the... Valid, you know. valid point. Yeah. I, I don't think I've ever seen anything filmed in 8K before. Where will I, where would I have seen something in 8K? Um, I think a couple of the YouTubers, are, they have 8K cameras. I know Linus and MKBHD, um, Devin Supertramp, they all have cameras that do 8K, but I don't know if they're uploading in 8K or not. Yeah. <laughs> or they are they are uploading an AK, they just haven't finished uploading yet. We yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Next month we'll be able to see their their work. Well, we've got a new uh, product to launch that we launched today. Uh, and Zach, I'll have to send you some so you can review them. Uh, so th this is our new carbon fiber spudger. And it, it looks identical to our old spudger, but the the it, it's got we we baked carbon fiber into the and, and spent a lot of time on the plastic formulation. So it's a lot stiffer and a lot more durable. This spudger that I have from years of use, we've kind of, you know, dinged the tip and uh, the new carbon fiber spudger, we're pretty excited about it. Cool. So when you're poking around inside stuff, um, the stiffness and the, the, the strength there from the carbon fiber means that you don't have to put as much force uh, to make something move at the end of your tip. Like basically it, you can affect more force inside of things with, with smaller movements, hopefully, is, is the idea. And um, But a, a bird tells me, a bird who is in the production studio, that maybe you have your own spudgers? Or you make your own? I mean, yes, I do. Yes. I do have my own. You make but your own or you have your own? I have my own manufactured. <laughs> so I've well, we'll have to, we'll have, to have them go head to head. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I haven't done any of the plastic formulation. Mine definitely aren't carbon fiber, but mine are prettier mm. colors. So there's that. <laughs> well, you're shaving, you're shaving precious grams in aerodynamics by using our carbon fiber spudgers. That way, you know, when they're flying through the air, you're getting so much more performance out of our spudgers. Just keep that in mind. No, you can you can repair more phones because it's less effort, right? That's it. Exactly. That's it. Yeah. We're we're the Greg Lamond of uh, phone repair now. Fewer slices of pizza per repair. That's right. <laughs> Well, yeah, you know, the new spudger doesn't come out every day. Uh, this is this yeah, is one of those really tools exciting. that, yeah, you know, if you if you're not in the electronics repair world, nobody knows what a spudger is, and you get into it, and we really start to care a lot about our tools. Yeah, I'm surprised you guys didn't do like the whole Apple like announcement event. You know, <laughs> spudger is here. This yeah. is it. This is our launch event. And then we you're, just you're on the iPod. only one invited. We just turn an iPod Touch behind us, and YouTube starts playing, and we announce the new carbon fiber spudger. <laughs> um, um, so are there any other tools that you use for your uh, for your videos and your teardowns that like are, are not kind of common screwdriver type stuff? Do you have to have any other do you have any other kit that we should know about so we can copy it, and make a carbon fiber version of it? <laughs> no, I mean, I have those little metal spudgers, but I think everyone has their own little version of those. Um, one thing. So I use a razor blade a lot in my because just I feel like it's super sturdy, super sharp. I can get like I can it opens phones really easily. The problem is like it also opens fingers really easily. And so <laughs> people are, are relatively, they're nervous about using a razor blade, which I totally agree with. Like they're dangerous things, but I just really like having a razor blade around. And is Are yours any different than the like, what, what do they call them? Safety razor blades that you buy like a pack of a hundred for like two bucks? 
Um, no, so they're like seven dollars oh. at Home Depot, and I've I've literally carried around a knife like this for the past like fifteen years. Like it's just yeah. always in my pocket. It How often are you swapping blades? Um, I swap a blade. I try to use a new blade on every phone, so I, probably once or twice a month. Every time a new phone comes out, yeah, <laughs> which is increasingly often these days. But yeah, there's a lot of new phones. Um, so you also probably have a pretty good blood cleanup tool that you have to keep handy. So I've only cut myself one time while making a video and it was not with the razor blade. It was with my metal spudger. <laughs> I was filming a video. It was the, hold on, let me think of which one it was. It was a star Wars speaker, like a levitating star Wars death star speaker. Um, I started filming the video. My tool slipped, slashed my finger open like bad. So I had to stop filming, wait a week for my finger to heal, and then film the rest of the video. Oh, no. Yeah. So there's that little tip. Production difficulty. I mean, we always say, you know, the, the, this is hard work where we are, you know, putting ourselves in danger at the, at the front line right. of, of right. new hardware. So, so you all don't have to. Well, that Star Wars kid, it struck you down, but you came back more powerful than I could imagine. Exactly. <laughs> it was victorious. The the AirPods, uh, we bled all over those. In the <laughs> yeah, I mean, that getting that that it, it's the the charging case. I mean, the, the AirPods themselves, you can pull them apart, but the charging case, getting that pried open and getting the battery out has been really a challenge. Dang, interesting. We have a ultrasonic cutting tool um, that's pretty interesting for cutting through plastic, uh, and that is uh, that that's the best tool that we've found. But it's like it's like in Star Wars, the vibro blade. It, it vibrates at incredibly high frequencies and, and the vibrations slice through plastic. It's, it's really slick. Dang, I'll just take a look at that. But they are, they're expensive. So it's the kind of thing like you wouldn't want at home, but you know, those of us who are in the industry <laughs> of professional teardowns, <laughs> <laughs> maybe can splurge right. on some fancier tools. Right. <laughs> well, so the, I want to talk about right to repair uh, for a, a minute. And there is a, um, there's a uh, process that's going on that, that kind of happens behind the scenes that, that uh, not very many people know about. iFix has been involved in this for a long time, but we don't talk about it very much, partially because it's wonky and boring, but it has big impact on, on uh, product design and where things are going. And that's the green standards for electronics. So yeah, if you go into a store and you get a cleaning product, maybe it has a green eco sticker. There actually are uh, fairly intensive standards that are that are developed. They're not laws, but these are these are usually voluntary standards where a, a group of experts and in industry and 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 maybe environmental NGOs and other folks get together and negotiate and come up with these are the requirements for the product to be able to have the sticker, and then you have certification bodies like UL where they certify products to these labels. And in the electronics world, uh, the, the green label that is most frequently used, at least in the U.S., is something called EPEAT. Uh, and it was initially developed by the EPA. That's the, the EPA, uh, E-P-E-A-T. That's um, EPA is part of that. And uh, it's run by a nonprofit out of Portland called the Green Electronic Council. And we get this. This is people always ask me, you know, what, where do you interact with Apple or how does what does Apple think of you? And really, the only interactions that we regularly have with Apple and the other manufacturers is at these standards development meetings. Um, and so I've participated for the last, oh gosh, six or seven years on the cell phone standard. Uh, so the cell phone EP, we sit in a room or we get on conference calls and I argue with Apple over whether the battery should be easy to remove or not. Uh, and and developing these standards has been a really interesting way to try to influence design. Now, the problem with this process is that I get outvoted every single time. Uh, so it's like Apple and LG and Samsung and all the other manufacturers, and then they'll be like the EPA and me. <laughs> and we're we're negotiating, and then it comes time to vote, you know, should we give five extra points for an easily removable battery? And the manufacturers all vote, vote no, like it's fine let us do whatever we want. We want complete design flexibility. And the EPA and I are saying, no, this would be important. Uh, so there's a new standards development process coming out, uh, and it's going to go through the NSF, which is not the National Science Foundation that you may be familiar with. This is the National Sanitation Foundation. And they actually develop a lot of eco standards. And they're going to be developing the next generation of cell phone and laptop standards. And there's an opportunity over the next couple of days for experts to weigh in. So if anyone out there is interested in, in uh, potentially volunteering, because like I'm involved because I want to be, but it's purely like, you know, I'm, I'm spending my time for the benefit of, of, of mankind, not, not, you know, getting paid for it. Uh, but there's a possibility that anybody can join. It's a, it's an open invite. 
Uh, so we are looking for maybe you know retired engineers or people that have extra time that want to participate in the standards development process. Um, now, fair warning, it's a little bit of a time sink. It's, um, it's the kind of thing where you're on a conference call an hour a week, maybe for a year. <laughs> um, and those conference calls are not always the most entertaining, but uh, at the end of that year, you, you, you know, help participate in a standard that will guide uh, where the entire electronics industry is going. Um, and so we are, uh, uh, we've put a call out uh, for, for people to, uh, to reach out to us. And if you're interested, we can, we can train you and, and, uh, and show you how to participate in this because we really need more balanced representation. And, and the NSF has said they're interested in balanced representation. They're interested in more people at the table. Uh, uh, it's, it's, just, it's just a time thing. And, and uh, iFixit only gets one seat at the table. So we're interested in other people, other organizations joining up. So, so Zach, go ahead. Out of curiosity, so this, uh, so they're coming out with this, you know, standard or whatever. Will it be on the box of cell phones, or where will we be able to see this standard? Um, they could. So this, the standard right now for cell phones is UL one hundred and ten. Uh, and on, uh, there are many uh, EPEAT certified UL110 phones. Um, the, uh, the Galaxy S10, I believe, is a, is an EPEAT Gold certified phone. Um, so it's up to the manufacturer whether they want to put it on the box. Some of them do. Some of them just make it available on, on the website. You can go to the Green Electronics Council website, and we'll, we'll post it in the show notes. And you can search for a product and see if a product is, is rated, and there's, there's a you know, bronze, silver, gold rating. What's interesting and where this carries a lot of weight is that the federal government is required to make 95% of their purchases have to be products on this list. So that's the incentive for the manufacturers is if Samsung wants the federal government, the U.S. federal government to be able to purchase Galaxy S10s, they have to get they have to get EP certified. Uh, and, and the federal government is the largest single purchaser of IT in the United States. Um, so, and, and, and the United States government, of course, is, is a large part of the global uh, landscape. So there really is a, a opportunity um, to influence, you know, wh what effectively is billions of dollars are purchasing down the road. I think they should be putting it on the box. Apple on their tech specs, when they have an EPEAT certified product, they'll say on the technical specification website that, it, that it's EPEAT certified or not on their laptops. Um, I, I, I haven't gone through and looked at the boxes of other, other companies to see who's involved. Cool. Um, Zach, I, I know you're busy. Um, if you, uh, I, I didn't know if you can stay on for uh, talking about MacBook keyboards, but if not, uh... um, I should probably take off. Okay. okay. Uh, let folks know where they can see you shoot at Teslas, mangle <laughs> Tesla bumpers, uh, mangle one. Let's. Where can they see all the the beautiful damage you do to our devices every day? So mostly on YouTube, Jerry Rig Everything. Uh, just all my videos are right there on the great platform that is YouTube. And your name is not Jerry. It is Zach. I know it took it took me like weeks of thinking about this to get around get this around my head. But your name is Zach. But your your channel is Jerry Rig Everything. Exactly. Yeah. When people recognize me out in public, it's usually like, "Hey, Jerry, how are you doing?" It's like <laughs> <laughs> do you have a Jerry can? Um, like the gas cans? Yeah. I do actually. Very good. Very good. And then, so coming up, you've got some, some looking, you're looking at a few phones. It sounded like you've got some other experiments in the works. Yeah, quite a bit, actually. The ones that I'm super excited about, I have this Sapphire video coming out in the near future. That's going to be fun. Um, and then I have uh, an off road wheelchair, which uh, is a better version than the one I made previously. So that'll also be very good. Fun. All right. Well, I thanks for uh, who that wheelchair is for. <laughs> thanks for uh, talking with us about uh, everything that we love to geek out about. No problem. I hope to be back again soon. Awesome. Thanks, Zach. Okay. Okay. So we have the uh, the 2019 MacBook Pro here in the studio, and this thing we it was uh, $2,400 plus sales tax. So this was not mm. a cheap. What's that? No, I'm just excited. I'm just excited. Yeah. Okay. Water dollars on something you immediately broke. Let's do it. Yeah. Well, and and we got and, and the initial question was, yeah, are we going to destroy it or not? And that was well, you know, science. We have to. So we have successfully. We we figured we would destroy keys that were less likely to be used. So we we pulled off first the right uh, command and option key because nobody ever uses those keys anyway. <laughs> Um, and, and, and then we, we also pulled apart the 2018 MacBook Pro. And so I have both parts here where we pulled apart the materials and we did a little bit of analysis of, of what is different between the 2018 keyboard material and the 2019 keyboard. Uh, and and I, we, the first thing that we did, we, we pulled it apart and we said, okay, these look 
pretty similar. So we're going to need to do some, more of a deep dive and 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 bring out the heavy guns to really understand what's and different. Just for just for a moment of context, the only thing going into this that you knew was because of Joanna Stern at the Wall Street Journal, who who eked out of Apple that there was a quote unquote new material. That's right. It. The Apple didn't say in their press release anywhere. It was just Joanna got Apple to yeah. say it was a it was a, a change to a material. Okay. Yeah, change to a material. That's it. And we're like, all right, what what you know, change to a material, change to materials. What is the change? How is it like I mean, because these keyboards have been catastrophically failing for people. Uh the the, the what what have been the main symptoms of failure that you've heard about? Um double uh, double key presses where you get two N's, two F's, two whatever's, uh, missing keys, uh, stuck keys, basically everything that you can imagine that could happen to a thing you press with your finger uh, going wrong. And, you know, the this wouldn't be as much of a thing if it weren't for the fact that, like, it's a $700-ish repair, uh, $500, $700, depending, and um, there's no way to get in and fix it. You just have to replace the whole thing. Apple has to replace the whole thing. To the point where they've now they now have a keyboard replacement program that even includes this brand new MacBook that they just released. Like they, they put out a brand new MacBook and they said immediately it would be covered by the keyboard replacement program, which is absolutely unprecedented. I have never heard of a manufacturer release a new product and then on day one say we know there's a problem with it, so we're gonna you know extend the warranty. To be like yeah. buying a Honda with a new engine, they're like, oh yeah, the car has a two year warranty, but the engine, you yeah. know. Yeah, it's or a little if iffy. you want a Ford SUV and they're like, don't worry, we've got a rollover protection program in place. <laughs> You'll be fine. <laughs> You'll like, be oh, fine. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Should be that's fine. I have what that's my explorer I was talking about. That that is one of those rollover prone explorers. I've I've managed to keep it upright. The if tires haven't exploded the entire time I've had it. Yeah. Okay. Well, so uh so then you said to yourself, I can't accept this offhand remark by Apple about their new materials. I must go to Right, so we I, I brought it down to our local university where we have some friends that have PhDs and fancy expensive equipment, and and we said, you know, here the the, the way the keyboard is constructed is is there's the, the main keyboard substrate, and then there's a there's a metal spring, and there's a plastic cover over the metal spring, and then uh, there is um, the butterfly mechanism, and then there's another uh, membrane on that, and then there's there's the keycap, and so looking at it initially, it seemed like the things that we thought they were most likely to change were the plastic cover over the uh, over the spring and then the spring itself. And so we took it down to the, uh, our, our buddies in the materials engineering department and, and had them <laughs> take a look at it. Did they, did they kind of laugh that you were showing them something that looked almost exactly like two of the exact same thing? Or is this like, this is their thing, is that people showing them two extremely similar materials and saying, what the difference? This is their thing. They were so yeah. serious. They were like, oh, and, and it was exactly the kind of problem they like having. We're like, here are two things that look the same. Tell us how they are different. We know they're like, oh, great. This is what we do. It was okay. they, These guys are just the uber material nerds. This is their sweet spot. They love the question. So what's um, a, what does it start off as? Is like a, is it a microscope at first? Just like seeing if you can even spot. Yeah, that was, I mean, at first we were just kind of looking at it with, with a naked eye and then, and then it was get it under a microscope and look at the mechanical properties with the microscope. Um, and you know, fortunately we've got our lab scopes here and then, and they had some, some scopes and we're, it, it's interesting. I mean, even just playing with the plastic material, I've got the 2018 and the 2019 plastic membrane and they, they visually and mechanically are different. So when I say they're visually different, the, the old material is kind of milky and the new material is clear. And then there's also kind of a, a pop spring mechanism to the new material where it, as you, as you push it, it kind of goes both directions. Um, so it'll kind of pop into what it, and and snap into whatever configuration that that you got. The other thing that we noticed was was when we we pulled apart the old one, we had um, uh, we had actually punctured the plastic in the process of getting it off, and mm -hmm. and we we applied kind of the same level of destructive force to the new one, and we didn't break it. So it's clear that this new material, which turns out is a is a nylon, uh, is uh, is actually quite a bit uh, more robust, which is I think what Apple was aiming for. Now, Apple hasn't put out, you know, which seems to be the death knell for any company is to put out a number like we were just talking about with the one plus seven or the Samsung Galaxy Fold, like 100,000 times, 600,000 times. Like they they never put out a number they saying a number. that a robot had typed on this laptop for 5,000 hours or anything. Right. And, and and they won't, you know, they've got the reliability that what they also won't tell us is they say this only impacts a small number of customers. Well, there's a small number of customers like 1% or 30%. Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, I mean, clearly we know it's a lot. I mean, Joanna Stern got onto this because it happened to her laptop. I think it happened to a couple different laptops that she had. So what are the odds? That I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the slight, slight disclosure for those who work in media, it's like all they do is type. So, you know, there, there is some self-selection there in that, like, these are very typey people. But again, what what do you use a laptop for if not to type in some ways? Is, yes, I spend all day typing. I So, I you know, also, I, I have my 2012 MacBook Pro. I have never had a keyboard problem with this computer. It has been rock solid. And we have, we've got 50 of these in the office, and, and we've never had a problem with these. Now, this is your traditional scissor mechanism, not the newfangled butterfly mechanism. Yeah. But what I hear is companies that have these butterfly mechanisms, they survey their staff. And I, uh, Basecamp did the survey, and I I think a substantial portion of their, their, their people, I forget the exact, yeah. number, but I thought it was like 30% had keyboard problems and, and they're underreported to Apple because lots of people just live with it because they can't afford to take their computer in for repair for a while. Either time-wise or money-wise yeah. to, to just go without their laptop that has like their entire dev kit on it for right. like five days right. or whatever. Well, I feel like we could do an entire episode just on this keyboard because it's so fascinating. But instead, I would say, check out the teardown. Check out our video where we interviewed um, a, a couple of materials uh, engineering experts. We had both a, a material engineer expert and we also had a metallurgist take a look at the at the, the spring because we thought maybe it was a metal fatigue issue. Um, the next step and what the engineers wanted me to give them is they said, can you give us some units that failed? They wanted to inspect the, the keys that were not working. And I didn't have because we don't use those those laptops here. We, we didn't have any any failed um, uh, laptops. But if anyone has one that they want to donate, has a has a keyboard or an uppercase that has a failing keyboard that you want to you want to send us, then we'll we'll happily throw it under the microscope. Uh, they have a scanning electron microscope that we're going to stick it under next to see if we can see micro fatigue cracks in the metal. So yeah. this is not the end of our keyboard investigation. It will continue. Yeah, and it feels like, I don't know, it feels weird that like able, Apple would be able to keep that kind of knowledge to themselves, possibly in perpetuity, um, because like, you know, isn't it important for all of us to learn from these things? Like, you know, isn't business school just a series of uh, stories about naming the Chevy Nova, the Nova, <laughs> the Bridgestone fire, you know, Ford, like aren't big business like, mistakes like really important for all of us to know about i think so and i mean i think i mean we learn you know we, when we talk about repairability well why do you need to repair something well because something went wrong so uh th this incident has brought to light that how important that repair score where we have given every retina macbook that apple has released since 2000 12, 2013, we've given them all ones or twos on our repairability index. We say these things are really hard to fail. And if they do fail, it has big consequences. And part of the consequence is when they make a little mistake on a, on a spring on the keyboard, it's very expensive to repair. Yeah. Uh, and, and that is something that, that I hope this starts to bring home. Like these repair scores really do matter. Let's, let's, let's factor them into our day-to-day -day lives and our purchase decisions and maybe stop buying the computer that gets a one out of 10. There's plenty of computers that do great. And, and a sneak preview for, for all of you that are watching, we are going to be releasing some more repairability scores on some uh, PC laptops and tablets uh, in the next in the next week or two. We've got we've got lots coming. We've, we've got all kinds of computers in the lab that we've been testing. So you absolutely have repairable options that are not uh, made by a fruit company in Cupertino. Very nice. Okay, well, this has been a fantastic episode. It's really nice of Zach to join us. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Uh, we'll call a wrap for this week's Repair Radio. We will be back in two weeks. Uh, stay tuned, and and don't forget to uh, subscribe to us and, to, and 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 rate us on your favorite podcast app. That's the best way to encourage us to keep doing this is if you leave a review. Uh, we get enough ratings that the algorithms point people in our direction. We get enough people listening that we can we can keep doing it. And if you're listening live, uh, check out our blog today. Again, what Kyle mentioned, we we could use some help uh, with a standards body, <laughs> especially if, you've, if you're very good with electronics or you worked in the field and you have some knowledge. Uh, we could use your help like ASAP. So check yeah, it out. We're looking for retired engineers would be, would be fantastic. Someone with a little bit of electronics experience. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful day.